Welcome to the Union Jews Podcast. The UK's only All Things Union podcast, designed for your downloadable digital delight and appreciation. For uh, equality to advance, uh, we need uh, either growing organisation where there's more place available, or we need the people in place to leave their place and, you know, to leave the position and to go back to go elsewhere. Hello, 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 and welcome. Welcome to Union Dues, the UK's only all things union podcast. I'm Simon Sapper, and the voice you just heard was that of Dr. Cecile Guillaume on what needs to happen to make the population of union reps more diverse, less male. You either need the pool of union jobs to be expanding, or you need some of those who have been in the pool an awful long time to move out. More from Cecile later in the programme. And we have a bumper edition for you this time. Well, it is the holiday season, as well as the winter solstice, so we've pushed the boat out a little. Our excellent, peerless, regular contributors will be here. Bazit Mahmood's Radical Roundup will be stuffed fuller than a Christmas stocking with the union news you probably won't find in the mainstream media. And Professor Mel Sims reflects on exciting new prospects for understanding how unions can best use data in her Thought for the Week. Our featured guests will give us a focus on unions and gender and gender equality issues, with women increasingly in senior positions in our unions and with proportionately significantly more women than men in union membership, have we nearly got to where we want to be on gender equality? Nikki Pound, who leads for this on the TUC, guides us through a landscape of more women in more leadership roles, more women joining unions, the UN campaign to end violence against women and girls, and how the menopause and menstruation are moving onto the mainstream negotiating agendas. And Dr. Cecile Guillaume, an academic specialist in employment relations at Surrey Business School, joins us to discuss what our women leaders all have in common, why female union participation is fairly described as a sandwich, and how Britain and France compare. As ever, you can find links, background, signposting to all that you hear on the blog post that accompanies this podcast. Head over to makesyouthink.com, click on the blogs option, and there you will find it. First up, we have Glasgow University's Professor of Work and Employment, Professor Mel Sims. This time in her Thought for the Week, Mel is looking at some exciting, important new prospects for making sure unions don't just use data right, but they also know exactly what they're using it for. This week, I've been reflecting on how we use data to organise more effectively. And the reason I've been thinking about that is because I'm really excited to have received funding from the UK's Economic and Social Research Council to fund a PhD student to research this really important question. And when they're eventually recruited, they'll work with two academic supervisors and they'll also be embedded with our union partner, who's the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy, the CSP. And as its name suggests, the CSP is the professional, educational and trade union organisation that represents over 60,000 physiotherapists in the UK. And they've been pioneering in their thinking about how they use data in their organisation, with a central challenge about how we use data to strengthen the effectiveness of organising work. And obviously, we don't have any clear answers yet because the research hasn't been done. But our starting point is to centre the needs of the users, in this case, the specialist organiser teams. A key focus will then be on how the data that union organisers need to do their jobs is collected and used, stored and perpetuated. And one thing I can certainly remember as an organiser is that the knowledge and information in the head of an experienced organiser is absolutely invaluable to doing the job well. 
information about how things work in different workplaces, what worked during a particular campaign, the responses of different workplaces to similar initiatives. All that helps build links and strategies and tactics to strengthen organising efforts. But that data is rarely codified and it's always at a risk of being lost when key people move on. Of course, not all of those things need to be codified or even could be if we wanted them to be. And there are very significant barriers and limits to the collection and use of this kind of data, some practical, some legal, some ethical. As a social scientist, I'm always acutely aware of power issues here. We always need to be careful when we create, use, store and perpetuate data about people. So we need to work hard to avoid some of the bad practices that many of our employers have fallen into over the years. But it's genuinely exciting to be able to work so closely with the union to look at these questions and to work out what we can do better to support the union activity that inevitably shapes the future of the trade union movement and the future of our working lives. Thank you very much indeed, Mel. Really thought provoking as ever, but also really good news, really good news that funding is coming through to look into the most effective use of data that unions can have can aspire to I mean, it's not, that, this is this is future proofing the movement it's, a, it's a kind of simple but as, as as big as that and if you want to find out more about the chartered society of physiotherapists approach to data then you might like to listen or listen again to a union news episode in which our featured guest is jenny andrew who is that union's first head of data Really interesting stuff, really dif- different stuff. And you can access that podcast where you access all your episodes uh, of Union Dues. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Nikki Pound. I was really pleased Nikki was able to accept an invitation to come onto the show. She is the TUC's Women's Policy Officer and as such works on a huge range of policy issues, including women's health and safety in the workplace, sexual harassment and gender-based violence, representation of women in unions, occupational segregation, women in the labour market, equal pay, sex discrimination and maternity rights, and I'm sure a lot more besides as well. Although we started off by reflecting on the growing number of women in leadership positions in the labour movement, we also took in just a small part of the campaigning work on gender issues that Nikki leads and supports. And we met at the start of the UN's 16 Days of Action to achieve the elimination of violence against women and girls. Nikki, you're very welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. With women consolidating their hold on the most senior positions in the trade union movement, and with the density of women in trade unions exceeding the density of men by seven or eight percentage points, what does that do for gender equality work? Does it mean that the race is almost run, or does that just reveal that there's almost like a sandwich with with women in leadership positions and more women members, but actually there's still a very kind of male dominated and, and discriminatory, exclusive filling. I think it's it, the the race is definitely not won, and I think any trade unionist would say that. I mean, trade unions operate inside the labour market as we know it, and if discrimination in the wider labour the market still exists then it exists everywhere so I don't think that trade unions would shy away or we should or that we should shy away to say we've still got work to do but I do think that where you can see so for example with the membership figures women now make up 57 percent of our membership and that's the highest it's been since 1995 and when you look at the way that issues such as flexible working paid carers leave, shared parental leave, menopause as a workplace issue, violence against women and girls in the workplace and why it is a workplace issue. I think when you look at how those issues have become more common on the bargaining agenda and the role that we now see where, you know, for example, like domestic abuse as a workplace issue, like under the Domestic Abuse Act, the statutory guidance that's going to support that does have a section for employers. So I think you can see that having more women in the movement as members and also as leaders, I think definitely helps to shape the priorities and shape the agenda and push those issues further up the agenda. However, that's not to say that there isn't still work to do within the movement in terms of those kind of 
positions sort of from being like a shop floor steward up to being like a leader in the movement you know there is definitely work to do there on how we support women into those kind of higher and middle management roles those policy roles things like that which again I think is reflective of the labour market more broadly I mean I think where we do have women now at the helm of our largest trade unions you know I think that is showing real leadership like I read something a few weeks ago where only six of the FTSE 100 companies have a female CEO so I think we are showing leadership in that sense as well but I mean yeah there's a long way to go yeah I mean what do you think the strategic milestones look like given given the situation you, you've just described because for example I was reading in the equality audit the TC's equality audit or it might it might have been the sister publication on flexible working but whereas flexible working and of course the impact of of that on women is is arguably greater than on on, on men that was the, the number one subject for discussion and and try and attempts to engage with employers and lots of employers were were actually engaging with the unions on on that but there's only 21% of unions have published guidance for negotiators on, on flexible working. I think that that was a stat that, that that stood out to me. So presumably making sure the movement has the capacity to move the agenda forward is, is high up the list of priorities. Yeah, absolutely. And I think with flexible working in particular, so the equality audit, the most recent one, was actually the survey was done just before the pandemic. So the results are sort of reflective of a pre-pandemic world and I think it's interesting that flexible working was already that high up the bargaining agenda even though actually I suppose a lot of people you know in the world of work feel like it's just become like such a big issue during the pandemic and I think it's interesting that it was already up the agenda at the TUC we have like our TU education facility where reps can go and you know have a look at the materials that we develop and you can take them away so that they're more specific for your workplace. And I know increasingly unions are developing their own guidance and sort of bargaining steps and model policies. So I think all of that stuff is is either exists but needs updating because of the change in the last couple of years as well with the pandemic or it's stuff that we're continuing to develop. And I think as well, you know, part of that flexible working program is also you know pushing for the legislative change that we need as well and I think that's why the leadership of the union movement needs to balance that pushing for the legislative change which is day one rights to flexible working advertising jobs as flexible up front and also then making sure that reps have the materials and also that reps have the time and the facility time and again that's why working with employers to make sure that reps have the facility time to be able to like find these materials and look at them, get their heads around them and work out how they can use them in their workplace. And I think particularly, you know, we do know that in the private sector, we do have a lower union density. And again, I think that's where, you know, we know a lot of women work in sectors like retail, um, hospitality. So again, there's a body of work to do there to make sure that our that A, we increase our presence in the private sector where we know a lot of women work as well, but also making sure that reps in those sectors have the opportunity to kind of to to do the training and to get and to get the materials and get their heads around them. Yeah, well the message that, that unions get you a better deal at work it is an organizing tool that resonates particularly in areas where historically union organization has been has been lower or or weaker. It's an it's a recruitment tool in itself, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think we can see with the pandemic, I think people are understanding or having a sort of reinvigorated view if you're not already a union member of like the role of trade unions and I know we've seen that membership growth more in the public sector than the private sector but we have actually seen even though we see some of the union membership decline in sectors like manufacturing where there's been job losses and such we have seen you know a lot of organizing in hospitality and sectors like that that have been really hit by the pandemic you know the entertainment industry so I think again I, I feel like as you say, it is a recruitment tool. And I think during the pandemic, we have really seen, for those people who maybe didn't have the experience of trade unions previously or the role that they play, I think it has introduced that to a new audience and, and to new people in the workplace. And, and not just in terms of the actual workplace negotiating, but also more broadly where unions have shown leadership on things like the furlough scheme, which you know was a trade union idea. And so I think we have 
been in, at the forefront during the pandemic and I think that will again help recruit more members and the more members you have and the more workplace reps you have the more you can organize and bargain of course of course of, of course and, and I think mm. one of the things that's happened over the pandemic thanks to the campaign work of TUC and, and affiliates is is there's there's also almost a new vocabulary that's come out and that that in itself I think can be quite empowering quite important in terms of of people literally having the words to articulate uh, their their demands and uh, and their aspirations, and I was I was interested to see that the equal pay audit stuff that has come out fairly fairly recently could be a case in point. I mean, listeners, you may have missed you may have missed this, but uh, a couple of weeks ago, the equal pay uh, the annual pay gap was updated by the Office of National Statistics. It shows that for full time workers, there's an eight percent pay gap between women's pay and, and men's pay, and if you take all workers part time and full time, then you have a 15.4% pay gap. Now, the fact that that information is published and therefore can be digested and articulated and, and factored into bargaining, I just think is has got great potential. Oh, absolutely. I, I think we cannot underestimate the value of pay gap reporting. And I know when, when the government suspended pay gap reporting during the pandemic, you know, we we were, you know, pretty upset about that because I don't think there was an excuse to do it, but mm. we're through that now. But it's good that, most companies did report their pay gap or most organisations, sorry, it comes everybody. And I think you cannot underestimate the value of being, as you say, being able to articulate discrimination that you know is happening. Like it's, yeah. it is a really useful tool on its own. It's not enough. You know, we do need to see mandatory action plans. And that was something we called for at the time. And it's something we continue to call for. And hopefully the government should be doing a consultation on the gender pay gap reporting in the next sort of year or so because they're committed to that five years after it was introduced. So we should see that soon. And I think it's really important that unions and other organisations interested in equal pay and in closing the gender pay gap do push for those mandatory action plans because I think once you can get employers to start thinking about, well, how are you going to close your pay gaps? And in a real structural sense, you know, Mm, not just like mm. changing one or two positions within an organisation, but actually really looking at your recruitment processes, your flexible working policies, your maternity and paternity, pay schemes, shared parental leave, all of those things that will help close the pay gap. And again, we need to see it as well expanded across other characteristics. You know, like we've campaigned for a long time on, having the, the equivalent for ethnicity and disability because we know that there are big pay gaps there and that inequality in sex. So but it is it is really, really important. And I mean, and I've had, I mean, I think the thing that sort of really, the thing that kind of got me in into the trade union movement and I ended up working in it was actually the organisation that I used to work for um, when they published their gender pay gap and it was quite large. I used to work in retail before I worked at the Mm. TUC and the response from the employer, I mean, they didn't even give us a heads up of what their gap was going to be before it was published. So we just found out on the day by going on the website and then it was quite large and this was an organisation that employed predominantly women as in and not just like 60 or 70 percent like over 90 percent of the workforce were women and they still had a very wow. large pay gap well, that's shameless behavior isn't it like, yeah absolutely and absolutely then absolutely shameless yeah absolutely and then you know we a few of us who were kind of in unions and sort of quite I suppose political as well emailed our HR team and we're like I feel like there's something that's here, eh, this is terrible, but also the fact that you've kind of not even given us a heads up and stuff. And that was kind of, we went back and forth with them and eventually got them to hold like a, a proper staff meeting to talk about the pay gap and why it was that big. I mean, it's still, the response was still not satisfactory, but it was, it's those kind of issues when you see it written down on paper and it really, it speaks to your personal experience, but I think it also kind of, it can really galvanise you know, sort of lighting a fire in everybody's bellies around this common issue. Absolutely, absolutely. And what, what gets me about this is, is, is the employers, I mean, did they think that people weren't going to find out? <laughs> did, 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 did they just think they could bury this under a rock forever? It's just like, hey. I mean, I think to that point as well, I think that is a really important thing about having good data about what is going on in the labour market, whether it's the pay gap or employment rates or the number of 
women you have in senior positions or the number of BME workers you have in senior positions or whatever it might be data on its own is not going to solve the problems but it does tell you what the problems are yeah and I think were things like pay gap reporting you know maybe in 2017 you know maybe not as many people were talking about it but now people do talk about it and people do talk about equal pay day. Like these are proper campaigning days that are established now. And I do think they are in the public consciousness yeah. a lot more than they were. And I think that is really important. Yeah, just to throw another another bit of data out, out there, 18th of November. 18th of November this year was the day on which women's pay was exhausted in comparison to, to male pay. Crazy. But I mean, from a productivity point of view, as well as a moral and ethical point of view, um, it, w- there are other specific campaigns, aren't there, Nikki, that the TUC is uh, involved in or running? Let's start with the United Nations campaign to end violence against women and girls. Each year, there's a, a particular period of campaign activity. And we're just at the beginning of that now as we're recording this discussion, aren't we? Yeah, so the 16 Days of Action is a UN-led campaign. It's been going for 25 years. It's a global campaign to sort of draw attention to the scale and extent of violence against women and girls, but then also to highlight what people are doing about it practically and what we can do. And I mean, unions have such an important role here. We know from our research, um, so we did some research back in 2014 on domestic abuse as a workplace issue, and we found that of the women who experienced domestic abuse, one in 10 said that the abuse continued in the workplace. They often threw harassing behaviour from their abuser, stalking, turning up at work, that kind of thing. And also, you know, preventing them from getting to work by hiding their keys or their transport money or not turning up for childcare. And then similarly, we've done a lot of research in recent years around sexual harassment in the workplace. And we found that basically one in two women have experienced some form of sexual harassment in the workplace that rises to seven in 10 for disabled women. And we also found that two in three LGBT workers have experienced sexual harassment in the workplace. So these are workplace issues because victims and survivors are in the workplace as are perpetrators, but also a lot of this does also go on in the workplace. So it is a really important issue for the trade union movement. Our focus sort of in the last I'd say 18 18 months, couple of years, and then this shift, the campaign, is on sexual harassment in particular. In 2019, we started campaigning for a preventative duty on employers, um, which we did as part of an alliance with other stakeholders, so, you know, other uh, preferred sector organisations and Vogue specialists to ask the government or demand from the government to introduce a preventative duty on employers that would mean that they have to be seen to be taking all reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment, regardless of whether a complaint has been made or not. Because at the minute, the current system relies on people coming forward, but we know four out of five women don't report because of the very real fear of the consequences, you know, being forced out of work, being moved into different jobs, being victimised, being bullied, being told to be silent, otherwise there'll be consequences for you, but none for the perpetrators. So, So we campaigned for that. We got that. So the government in July announced that they will introduce that during this um, parliamentary term, we hope. And we think it will be pegged to the employment bill because that seems like the most appropriate legislative vehicle. But we don't know when that's going to be. So our focus now is on getting reps equipped and trained up to kind of bargain for the steps that need to happen in the workplace and to get employers to start taking action now, like, Don't wait for legislation to come in. You need to be doing this now, A, because the legislation is coming, but B, because it cannot be right that this is going on in our workplaces. For sure, for sure. And and it's also really important because you cannot tackle sexual harassment without tackling the cultures and the power dynamics and the behaviours that allow it to thrive. So that's about tackling sexism and misogyny right from, you know, sort of not promoting women to positions because you kind of don't value them talking over women in meetings when you know you shouldn't be doing that like it covers everything like we have to kind of tackle this from the absolute root so that's our focus for this 16 days we've developed a toolkit for reps that kind of sets out some of the sort of 
first steps that you need to be negotiating for in the workplace. So that's things like having an anonymous climate survey to understand what is going on in your workplace, Mm. a risk assessment to look at like how does your workplace potentially um, exacerbate the risk of sexual harassment and what can employers do about it? So is there alone working? Are people working late and then not being able to travel home safely? Are you exposed to more third parties, which might, again, potentially, depending on the context, increase the risk of um, sexual harassment? And then also an example policy of the sorts of things that an employer should be committing to in a kind of zero tolerance approach yeah. to sexual harassment. I mean, it's not you know, it's not rocket science, is it? I mean, it's just, <laughs> but it's a mindset, isn't it? And, and we've, we've seen on some occasions inside our own movement where, People just don't get it, and they, they, their minds are, 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 are focused in certain, and wide in such a different way that they, you know, when 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 you say, "Do you realise this is what you're doing?" The reaction can be profound. I mean, sometimes there can be this huge culture of denial, of, of course, but on other on other occasions, you almost see the light bulb go, go on above their head. Um, um, I, I, another issue, that, another issue that I know the TC has been been actively involved in and been encouraging and supporting affiliates get it get involved in is on the impact of the menopause on women in the workplace. And I, I think it'd be interesting to spend a bit of time kind of chatting chatting about that because it is this is another one of those areas that that has been. It's it's just it's been there forever, but it's lain unspoken about, you know, until very recently. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think trade unions have been doing work on this for quite a few years. So Wales TUC did an absolutely brilliant report supporting that, produced a lot of materials and stuff. And that was back in 2017. And I would recommend anybody to find that on our website because it really is a really comprehensive um, set of materials. But Yeah, absolutely. In the public sort of consciousness. And I think more broadly in the movement, like I think it has really exploded in this last year or so. And I think, you know, there's been some really great political campaigns. You know, Carolyn Harris has obviously been had her menopause bill. Um, There's been a lot of coverage on it in the media as well. Um, But I think, you know, trade unions, they've been developing policies for the workplace. And again, where we say about our women members, it's something that they've been pushing for and they've been raising because it's what they're experiencing in the workplace. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is really shocking, the statistics. So I think Booper earlier this year released a report where they've estimated that around a million women have been forced out of work because wow. of their menopausal symptoms or oh more goodness. accurately, I would say, their lack of support for them while they're going through this process. And there was another one quite recently where it was something like one in eight women losing their jobs or or leaving the workforce because they're not being supported in the workplace and you know we know older workers are a really growing demographic as well within the labor market so again I think that's part of the reason as well maybe why it's come up the agenda more because there are more women who are going through perimenopause which can start you know in your early 40s and there's more women sort of working later into life in their working lives and I just think you know, people are experiencing this in the workplace and sort of thinking there's just absolutely no support in a lot of workplaces and no recognition. And again, I think that, you know, I think all of the stuff that we talk about when we talk about women's equality, whether it's violence against women and girls in the workplace or the gender pay gap, I do, I mean, I feel this, like, and I, I imagine a lot of women in the movement do. I think the more that they come up on the bargaining agenda and the more they become part of, like, our language and what we talk about, the more comfortable you feel to raise issues, whatever they are, and that kind yeah. of thing of like menopause and menstruation being these like taboo subjects, mm. I think that taboo has really started to break down. And I think it is partly to do with specific campaigning on those issues, but I also think it is just more broadly. We've got more women talking about these issues and it is more common to talk about them. And once you feel comfortable talking about one issue, you can sort of be like, well, hang on, here's a list of 20 yes, more yeah. Um, yeah. that we need to talk about. But it is a really important issue. And I think, you know, it's a really important health and safety issue. I think that's the other thing that we've been talking about a lot. And like, I go and talk to a lot of affiliates, like branch meetings and conferences mm. and stuff. And the thing that comes up with all of these issues, you know, whether it is menopause or menstruation or violence against women and girls, you know, various things, you know, people are like, these are health and safety issues. Yeah. They're not just women's issues or they're not, yeah. they don't sit in a certain box. And I think, you know, that is 
something that again for the whole movement regardless of your gender like we need to sort of make sure that reps whoever they are understand that this is you know it's an occupational health issue yeah. and you talk about that in the same way you would any other occupational health issue yeah but i, I absolutely get get the, the the notion of of not thinking that this is in a box and you, you can just put the box somewhere and forget about it but in unpacking uh, unpacking the issue it's not just for safety reps to pursue this is it this no, is this absolutely. is mainstream negotiating agenda yeah absolutely um yeah it's not just for health and safety rep so i think it would i think one of the things we would like to focus on in the next sort of year or so is like how can we get more women to be health and safety yeah. reps because yeah. i think that would be well any positions within the union but i think that would be a particularly interesting and useful one but yeah you're absolutely right it should it's part of the bargaining agenda that thing of like what you know what does a good workplace look like and what are the policies they need to support that and you know absolutely having a having a menopause policy and having an approach to it that does destigmatize menopause does sort of give people the support that they need and um, but some of this stuff also links into the other bargaining things so flexible working is like yeah. it's flexible working is such an important policy for so many different areas but not least you know menopause and menstruation because it will allow people to yeah. manage their symptoms in a way that isn't really that difficult for employers but it also kind of it's just part of the broader employment work situation so it cuts across everything absolutely yeah if we if we were to roll forward a year or so what are the what are the priority objectives for your area of work in the TUC I as I mentioned we do hope to see the employment bill at some point um for, for listeners who haven't been following it the employment <laughs> bill has been long promised um, yes, and, and, and has yet to be delivered that's yes, for sure yes and ro- rolls in rolls on year after year but we are hoping that we will see it perhaps towards the, like maybe this time next year if not a little bit earlier and that is a really important opportunity from a sort of lobbying perspective because there's just so many things that we need to see kind of pegged to that legislative vehicle so flexible working rights in you know as I said a day one right to flexible working not just the right to request it which is what the government have announced so far which isn't much of a change from what no. already existed and, and an advertising duty as well and as I said the preventative duty on employers to prevent sexual yeah. harassment we also want to see reform of shared parental leave so again we know that one of the big drivers of the gender pay gap and the gender pensions gap which is nearly 38 percent so more than double the gender pay gap we know that one of the big drivers of both of those things is the disproportionate burden of caring responsibilities on women and the motherhood penalty and all of these things and how that impacts their working lives and things like shared parental leave could be a really great tool to try and equalize care between yes. mums dads or co-parents but the current system less than three percent of eligible families take it up it's really unaffordable so it's yeah. paid at like 152 pounds a week so when you've also got a gender pay gap and it's likely that you know in a mum dad scenario dad probably earns more than mum so you know they're not going to be able yeah. to take all that time off I and mean, it's really complicated so we want to see really decent reform of that. It needs to be overhauled completely, um, to be frank, to enable that equalising of care and between parents. And things like paid carers leave as well are really important. So from a legislative point of view, there are some of the priorities. As I said, from a violence against women and girls point of view, the sexual harassment work is a really top priority for us for all organisations and regardless of whether that legislation comes in or when it comes in we want to see employers taking the steps now like you know I did, I've done a lot of events in the last couple of weeks um, because of the 16 days of actions and you know talking on panels and stuff with various other stakeholders who have real expertise in this area as well in in sexual whether it's sexual harassment or violence against women and girls in general and I, I sort of feel a bit like I don't know how much more data we need yeah before we actually start taking actions I mean um the femicide census on the 25th of November published figures that showed that 126 women have been murdered since the 25th of November 
the previous year. Goodness. I mean, yeah, what, what, what more do you need? Yeah, absolutely. For us, I think just really making progress on the practical steps now. Like we've got the data. We've got an idea of how we can start taking those first steps. And it's not going to be easy. Like I'm not going to sit here this time next year and be like, oh, we solved it by any stretch. But we can start making them steps now. And we really, really do need to start because I just like how much longer can this go on yeah. for really? Yeah. Well, Nikki, thanks so much for spending time with us and, and talking about, you know, the many areas of, of of work that you're involved in and the progress and the, the, the plans for making further progress and, and the best of luck. For the period to Thank come. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. My thanks to Nikki for a really thorough and insightful conversation around the many, many policy issues that sit under that gender equality umbrella. Those figures on violence against women and girls, they're just chilling and they show just how far as a society, let alone a movement, we, we have to go. But the increasing mainstreaming of issues around the menopause and menstruation and many other issues as well show that progress continues to be made. You can find links and signposting to more information on the myriad of issues Nikki and I have covered on the blog post that accompanies this podcast, which, as I hope you know, can be found on the makesyouthink.com site. But what do the women in leadership roles in unions have in common, if, if anything? And if there is this so-called sandwich effect, why is that the case? And what can we do about it? Oh, and by the way, do French unions have any useful lessons or best practice we can draw on here in the UK. To find out, I sat down and had a chat with Dr. Cecile Guillaume, an expert in employment relations at Surrey Business School. Her new book is titled Organising Women, Gender Equality Policies in Britain and France, and it's published on the 16th of December. Cecile Guillaume, thank you very much for joining us on the Union Jews podcast. Your, your book, which is just about to come out, which compares the experiences of women in trade unions in the UK and France, is very, is very timely in, in many ways. If we look at the UK first, what do you think characterises women leaders in UK unions particularly? Yeah, I think most uh, British women uh, union leaders have indeed special characteristics, but French as well. But I will, I will stick with the British. And most of them, uh, such as uh, Christina McAnea, which I've interviewed a couple of, you know, some years ago, or Sharon Graham, or even Frances O'Grady, they are women of the 70s generation. They're not very young. They usually come from white working class backgrounds and uh, they were often politically trained in their families or through participation in major strikes or political groups, political groups. And to some extent, they were highly politicized when they started their union career. They also often went back to university or attended major uh, TUC training courses to acquire the technical or managerial skills that they need for a trade union career. And uh, while they sometimes had, at the beginning of their career, low-paid part-time jobs, which we know can make uh, trade union participation difficult, they were able to become a full-time trade uh, union activist or union officers at a fairly young age, because there was some possibility at the time to do so. And it helped them to build the legitimacy internally, to learn the skills, to build network. And, and sometimes they also had uh, the experience to confront uh, tough employers or to take on new roles, such as organizing or equality duties. Mm -hmm. uh, when those policies were launched in the 80s or 90s, and uh, if we think about the TUC Organizing Academy, for instance, for Francis O'Grady, and they themselves also benefited from the progression of equality policies within their union. So it's a specific context. And they were also strong enough not to be discouraged in the in contexts that are still very macho, especially for male-dominated unions such as Unite or GMB, where these women have experienced all kinds of harassment and discrimination, as witnessed by the recent election of Sharon Graham, as head of UNITE, where she mentioned herself in The Guardian that her election took place amid a, a smear campaigns of disgraceful online abuse associated with a refusal to stand aside for uh, two more prominent uh, male rivals. And the GMB itself has been described as uh, institutionally sexist in 2020, so it's really very recent. 
And the other characteristic of these women is that some of them have been elected at a time of uh, internal tensions and conflicts in their union, such as uh, Sharon Graham, for instance. And this has opened up some opportunities for them. However, like in the political world, for instance, if you think about Theresa May or other political leaders, uh, female ones who did manage to access leadership in a context where nobody wanted, Mm. for instance. Mm -hmm. However, this kind of situation, this crisis situation, which justified to some extent or or allowed the advent of an atypical leader, such as as a woman, uh, can lead to what we call a glass cliff phenomenon uh, that describes the fact that women are more likely than men to be elevated into leadership during a crisis when the risk of failure is higher. Mm, mm, And because of that, of course, they might face a backlash as well when they reach the upper levels of leadership without the necessary political backing, for instance, or the peer networks that that usually support your, um, your leadership, and perhaps also the necessary experience, which is not the case for the two women I was speaking about. And we know there's a lot of different examples of that phenomenon in the political world and in trade unions, as in France and in Europe as well. And we also know that women last usually less time in their leadership role than men. And we have, again, a lot of examples when these women manage to access leadership position and they leave quite soon. They don't stay very long, either because it's too difficult for them, they don't have the necessary background or experience, or they face really a stronger position. And on top of that, these exceptional opportunities come with a very high personal cost for women, especially mothers or parents, because they must conform to the persistent masculine norms of union careers, complying with the long hours, you know, culture, high geographical mobility. And because of their family responsibilities, they usually struggle more than men to meet these obligations, even if some of them had the support of their partner or family or have chosen to have to don't have children or to have only one child for instance or to have a small family and these difficulties are well known within unions and uh, they have long tried to help with child care or promote family friendly meetings or policies for instance but the difficulties of combining union and private life has are uh, probably uh, even bigger uh, nowadays, especially in feminized profession, where many of these women come from, education, health, or you know, uh, public service, for mm-hmm. instance, because of the working conditions in those workplaces with staff shortages, man- management pressure, lack of facility time, or sometimes victimization as well as a u- union activist, which makes uh, women participation even more complicated than before. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that that is increasingly obvious uh, about the UK trade union scene is the fact that women are more unionised than men. So at the same time as we have women, historically unusually high number of women in leadership positions, we also have a higher level of of density for female employees than male employees by by about eight or nine percentage points. I think 27% for women, 20% for men. So this, to my mind, creates, and I think you've expressed it this way yourself, creates a sandwich. You have women at the top and women at the bottom, but in the middle, there's a there's a there's a block or there's a, a very heavy concentration of male influence, male, male population. What do you think would need to change? To, 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 have, to, to, to make the, the sandwich filling, if you like, more equal? I think, first of all, you have to look into the reasons for that sandwich kind of shape, you know. And there are several reasons for what I call a, a selective feminization. And this, I think there's two aspects in, in this selectivity. The first one is that, like I was saying, uh, most of the women who succeed in, uh, in those roles come very uh, from very specific background, and there are very, very few low-paid BAME women in that lot, and, and especially younger ones. And I think this is also something that probably trade unions should reflect on, is, is how they address 
of course, gender inequalities, but also class and race inequalities. And like I was saying, these women are quite exceptional in the fact that they usually they, they come from usually a working class background, but they went back to uni. They went, you know, they had the possibility because it maybe it was possible at the time, maybe because they had a, a supportive family, a supportive partner, and a supportive union as well. They could go back and learn what you need to learn today to be a union leaders because they there is a professionalization of union, union activism to some extent, and you need to, to, to know a lot of skills, to have, to have a, a lot of knowledge, and to have a stable employment as well, to have some facility time. And it's very, very difficult for, for the other women I was speaking about. So I think this is something that we don't... Some unions have, have, have tried to address that kind of issues, such as Unison, for instance. They have reserved seats, for instance, for low-paid women. Women, that's a recognition of this class and race. The intersectionality, yes. Exactly. Yeah. But it's very, very rare. It's exceptional, I would say. It's the only union I know in France, uh, everywhere at least, uh, and especially in the UK that does that. But it's a real recognition of those difficulties. And I think the other aspect, so this is one of the reasons, one of the selectivity aspect I was speaking about. And the other one is that on top of that, even women with more credentials, with more, you know, possibilities, with uh, a stable employment, with access to knowledge, with, uh, you know, they still have to face the way trade union career are organized and the fact that uh, accessing, sorry, union leadership roles continue to depend on informal detection and selection mechanism and the support of mentors. And most of the time, yes. they are uh, older, uh, senior, uh, white men who do open the door to leadership position and provide related advice. And this peer support is very significant, very important, because formal training uh, doesn't really exist. Formal leadership training doesn't exist uh, or is very rare uh, in, uh, within trade unions. And uh, it's not compensated by a women-only education that existed, that used to exist in, in trade unions and still exists, but for higher level, I would say, leadership position. And additionally, and this is very specific to the UK, the, the, the internal labor market uh, in British trade unions is characterized by a very low turnover. And it hinders the renewal and diversification, of course, of leaders. And uh, I remember when I started uh, working on this topic when I was younger with a French trade union, I told them, you know, if you want women, if you want young people, if you want, you know, different type of leaders, you have to help the ones who are in charge to uh, leave the trade union movement. You have to help them to go back to work, to find a work if they have, you know, no work anymore because they've left their work for a long time, long time ago. You have to make sure we can recognize the competencies and the skills they have acquired during their trade union career. So they can be, you know, comfortable enough to go out there and to find another type of job and then to leave their role, to leave their place. And it's the problem with trade unions, because for, for we know research has shown that for uh, equality to advance, uh, we need uh, either a growing organization where there's more place available or we need the people in place to leave their place and, you know, to leave yeah. the position and to go back to go elsewhere. And in the UK, uh, trade union careers have, have become very professionalized. People, yeah. will, I mean, the full time paid officials and officers, they stay in place, but they stay because they love their job. Usually they're very committed to their job. This is what they know. This is how they need, you know, and it's a very specific internal labor market. Well, so it is. Them switch from one to another. We know huh, that there is a, some sort of, um, it's not a, it's not like football, but there's a method <laughs> there where you can go from one trade union to the other or go to the TUC or, you know, and you can stay within the trade union movement. Sometimes maybe go to the Labour Party as well if, if it's open, but it's a very narrow kind of labour market. Yeah, yeah. And there's a, there's a triple whammy here. First, first of all, these are not organisations generally that are expanding. Okay, this no. membership is stabilized, but it's not expanding. You're right. Um, sec secondly, we're in uh, we're in a political environment in which a range of other jobs, for example, is not necessarily available. Yeah. And thirdly, of course, we've with the abolition of a default retirement age, 
These people can stay in post forever and ever and ever until literally they die <laughs> in, some, in some cases. There are things that explain all of these things. But one of the one of the consequences inevitably is that there is there are less opportunities for different sorts of people, different demographics to fill roles in the in the trade union movement. So <laughs> fascinating and depressing. But um, how, how do I mean your, your your book comparing British unions and French unions is just about to be published? What's the difference between the union structures in in, in the two countries? Um, I think we have to uh, to recognize that, and this is why I've done some research uh, with the UK, is that I was impressed by the fact that some trade unions uh, have been pioneers in implementing really radical equality policies as early as the 70s, and uh, they put in place specific measures, reserve seat, women-only education courses, recognizing the need for women to have safe space and to learn, you know, to get to be empowered. And uh, most of them have gradually achieved proportionality on their ruling bodies. We have to, to recognize that as well. Uh, they also have, like I was saying, recognized the additional difficulties, low paid and BME women have to participate in trade unions because of the characteristic of their work, often working part-time, small companies where union rights are in existence, zero-hour contracts, all of these. And it's not the case in France. We have exactly the same difficulties, to be honest. But French trade unions have been very slow to implement proactive equality measures, probably because of the universalist and egalitarian framing that characterize equality policy and framing in France. It's difficult for us to uh, implement uh, measures in favor of, of certain group only. Yeah. Uh, this is something that goes against a lot of beliefs that we have. And for instance, a self-organized group, for instance, for BAME workers or LGBT members are quite difficult to implement even if we know that they're very efficient and they're needed. But trade unions have made progress. They have introduced uh, quotas for women in, in ruling bodies. Uh, bodies sorry. Uh, the turnover as well is higher in France uh, because we have probably more union rights as well. Still, not for long, mm. but we have some. Uh, so it, it does encourage the participation of women and it, it does encourage as well the, the, the fact that you know, some men can do something else as well. Uh, and we, we had um, specific legislation on uh, the recognition of trade union competencies and trade union careers. So it's it has been helpful. And we also have legislation uh, introduced uh, in 2015, where it is now mandatory for local branches to have proportional uh, list when they present uh, stewards, because you need to be elected in France to, to become a steward. Uh, yep. So uh, it has helped. It's a proportionality thing. So it's not one woman and one man. It depends on the, the workforce demographics. But it has helped from the bottom. It, ha it has helped from the top as well. In the middle, it's more complicated, like in the UK, for yeah. the same reasons. The mentoring, the, the informal mechanism by, by which you are recognized and identified potentially as a, as a leader is still the same. But I think trade unions are probably, they, they, I would say there's so few people now that want to get involved and participate in trade unions, you know, in trade unions. I think it's 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 even difficult to attract anyone. So, so the competition is less fierce between men and women. So it's more a question of generation generational kind of renewal. Yeah. 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 So our trade unionists are very old now, especially at the workplace level. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, it's very difficult to replace them. So of course there is a women problem, there is a class and race problem, and um, it's true. But there is, a, a, I think, a wider problem is that young people uh, don't really care about trade unions, whether, yeah. even if they're men or women, or whatever. And I think this is another thing that, I'm, of course, it's not the, the the subject and the topic of my book, but uh, it's a, it's the broader context in which we are. Yeah. And um, I don't have the answer. At the moment, we are trying to do a, a large survey with the CFDT, which is a large French trade union. 
to understand where young people and people in general uh, contribute if they, and yeah. you know if they've been asked to contribute or to, to participate in a trade union or not or we'll see the results I, I would be surprised if trade unions would be one of the area or the, the you know the place where they want to participate <laughs> But, there but, might be some explanation there. But nevertheless, just in order to, I, I mean, I like the idea of mapping or surveying the involvement of young people in trade unions to yeah. see to see which unions have been more successful at engaging with young members than others and why. Hmm. And I think that could be, I mean, I think that could be a very, very important piece of work, both for France and the UK. Yeah, it would. Cecile, thank you very much indeed. You're welcome. Well, my thanks to Cecile, and I, I don't think there's an awful lot more I can add to that. It's a worrying thought that we may be at a high point of women at senior levels in the movement, as the generation who were born or grew up in the 1970s, which has been lauded as the most equal decade in UK history, move up through and out of the labour market. But then again, we have the high rate of women members of unions than men, and part of that legacy of the 1970s and 80s was the establishment of pretty robust equality networks, which can and do provide a platform for greater involvement and a more inclusive agenda. Yet, as both Cecile and Nikki point out, there is a high level of intersectionality between gender and race, sexual orientation, disability, age, and a growth of oh, xenophobia, cancel culture, intolerance, call it what you will, there is clearly still an awful lot of work to be done. No room for complacency whatsoever. I'm put in mind of a young union rep I know who was basically marginalised, lost the role he was enjoying and doing well in. You see, a much older rep was just half a day a week short of 100% facility time. So he took it from the younger rep. The rest of the branch committee were much closer to the older guy in every sense. So there was no pushback. Now, I hope you agree, not only is that wrong in more ways than I can count, it's also it's suicidal in terms of future-proving the movement. As Cecile said, it's hardly like we're blessed with massive oversupply of activists. So a big shout out and even more solidarity to all those working to make sure that the equality glass is at least half full and getting fuller. As ever, if you have a view on the issues we've discussed or suggestions for what else and who else we should feature on the show, please, please do let us know. You can email us at unionjews at makesyouthink.com you can tweet us at Jews Union. Now it is my pleasure to welcome back to Union Jews, Bazit Mahmood from Left Foot Forward with his Radical Roundup. Over to you, Bazit. Thank you so much, Simon. Now we've got quite a few interesting stories coming up in this week's Radical Roundup, looking at issues of low pay and industrial action just before Christmas. Now, industrial action is being threatened at carmaker Aston Martin as workers face losing about £100,000 in retirement income as a result of changes to the defined benefit scheme, which is being closed down next year. The United Union says its members affected by the proposal in Warwickshire, Milton Keynes and Wales have voted overwhelmingly in a consultative ballot they wanted to hold full-scale industrial action in the new year to protect their retirement incomes. Aston Martin wants to close the defined benefit scheme on the 31st of January which the union's pension expert estimates could cost members about £100,000 over the course of their retirement. Now, the TUC says that ministers must act to prevent job losses as restrictions to combat the rise of Omicron begin to bite. It comes after the Office for National Statistics released figures which show payroll employees up on pre-pandemic levels, but self-employment down by 759,000, and the level of real pay falling for six months since April. TUC's Francis O'Grady says that the Omicron variant is spreading fast and the economy is slowing. Francis calls on the government for a plan B to protect jobs and livelihoods. And finally, the Independent Workers' Union of Great Britain has revealed the company Stewart, which delivers for Just Eat, gave its highest paid director a 1,000% pay rise last year, as the corporation made an extra £20 million profit during the height of the pandemic. The revelation that CEO Damien Phillips' Francis Xavier Bond took home more than £20 million pounds set to spark outrage as Just Eat Korea's working for Stuart enter their second week of strike action over a devastating 25% pay cut. Despite promises to postpone made by Stuart following protests by OWGB Korea, pay was slashed from the 6th of December and most deliveries from £4.50 to £3.40. 
that's all from me in this week's Radical Roundup. You can find a full Radical Roundup on our website tomorrow. Back to you, Simon. Many thanks indeed, Bazit. Just a, a, a point on that report from the Office of National Statistics that Bazit drew our attention to. We had noticed all the way through the pandemic that there's been this movement of people out of self-employment and into employment. And it's not entirely clear why that's happening or what inferences we should draw from that. But one thing absolutely is clear, and that is if real earnings are not moving ahead, we've got a problem. We've got a problem as a labour movement. We've got a problem as an economy as well. So that's something really to keep a close eye on. Well, we are just about out of time for this episode and indeed for this year. I do hope you've enjoyed what you've heard over the last 40 minutes or so, that it's been food for thought, perhaps made you think. And if you like Union Dues, you may also like some of the other shows accessible on the Labour Radio Podcast Network. The network is a portal through which you can access over 150 union-related shows, and Union Dues is certainly proud to be part of it. You can access the portal at labourradionetwork, or one word, dot org. Don't forget that you can contact the show. We're on Twitter at Jews Union and the email is unionjews at makesyouthink.com. Do get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. And also, if you wouldn't mind racing us on the podcast platform of your choice, that really would be very much appreciated. Go on. It is the season of goodwill and all that. It's only five stars. Ah, thank you. Thank you in anticipation for that. The companion blog to this podcast can be found on the makesyouthink.com website, all the signposting, background, all the links you need to all the different varied subjects that we've discussed on the show. So it just leaves me to say thank you. Thank you very much to Nikki, to Cecile, to Mel and to Bazit. Thanks above all to you for spending some of your valuable time with us. We've loved having you along. We'll be back bright and early in 2022. Next episode is due to drop on the 11th of January. Until then, a peaceful and healthy holiday season to you and your families. Strength, solidarity and solace to those having to dig particularly deep to protect pay, conditions and jobs. Stay safe, be kind and I will see you next time on the Union Jews podcast. Bye for now. The Union Dues podcast is presented by me, Simon Sapper. It is a Makes You Think production. <laughs>